So here's the promise we're going to make to you. This will be absolutely, positively, no more than an hour. Which means what? Could be less. <laughs> Could be less. But no more than an hour. Yes. And if we finish on time, I'm buying drinks. There we go. <laughs> what if we're early, though? Then you're buying. <laughs> Which well, one? That, no, they don't want that. That's, that's, a, that's a terrible choice. Um, no, thank you again for sticking around. We are going to, you know, it's really funny. We, we had this conversation today, literally today, with a new client um, where they are very concerned about workers moving during the pandemic and having remote workers. And they found somebody in New York, in New York right now. They had somebody in New Jersey. Someone moved out to Colorado, and they're very concerned about what to do there. How's it going to impact them? Because they hadn't filed anywhere. They hadn't withheld anywhere. They hadn't done anything. And, you know, from the holding tax perspective, that's one thing. But from an income tax perspective, from a sales tax perspective, I said, it doesn't matter. They go, well, you know, we could talk about 86272 we talked about earlier today. Does it create nexus? And they go, yeah, probably. You got an IP person, an IT person someplace else. You've got an a a payroll person in another state. You had interesting people like marketing people, but not salespeople in a third state. And I went through all the 86272 analysis on what we can argue. And I said, but before we get to that, do you have any sales in those states? And like, no, we sell everything in Texas. I go, then it doesn't matter. <laughs> you can have Nexus everywhere because the key then is, where's, where do you cite us to sales? If you have no income going to a state, it doesn't matter if you have Nexus, right? And it just seems so obvious we didn't get to that part of it until the end because they were so concerned about where their people were so nexus is important obviously you know but what we're going to talk about to me is really important because it's only important if you have something there and the difficulty we're getting to right now is how do you know if it's there when we dealt in the tangible personal property world it was relatively easy relatively easy where'd you send the stuff if i'm selling these wonderful makeup slash um, like stuff things that you roll up and you put in there. These are the best things. If I if this goes somewhere, you can follow it. You may not want to, but you follow it. You know where it went. Easy to do, right? Maryland has got a wonderful portfolio on drop shipments, which messes all that stuff up. But ultimately, it goes somewhere. Except in Ohio, which has the ultimate destination rule, and it's got these wackadoodle cases, Mia and Greenscape, which totally blew my mind, but we'll get into that later on. But for most part, you follow it. And what's even cooler about it, in the sales tax arena and in the income tax arena, it's basically the same. Woohoo! <laughs> we can make our lives easy. Right now, let's agree that whatever we put down for apportionment purposes and income tax is how you fill out your sales tax return. Or the other way around. If you fill out your sales tax return, you got sales in the state, that's what you report for apportionment purposes. That would be easy. What would we do? What would we do the rest of the week? We'd be done on Mondays. It'd be ridiculous. Of course, we don't do it that way. And really, what we're going to focus in on is some TPP stuff, but the, really, the world now is centering around things other than tangible personal property, both from a sales tax perspective and from an income tax perspective. And we can't call them the same <laughs> things, right? Because that would make it too easy. But on the income tax side, we're talking about market based sourcing. What does that mean? How does it work? And how come I end up paying more than 100% now, right? That's, that's really what we're going to worry about. And I tell everybody, what's the goal? Our goal used to be pay less than 100%. With market-based sourcing, your goal is to pay no more than 100%, right? Because you're going to, they're going to trap you somewhere. And really, the way the states are interpreting it differently, the opportunity to pay on over 100% is great now, right? And they don't care. You know, they, they care if you're paying less than 100%. They don't care. If you're paying more than 100%, that's not our problem. Same thing's holding true on the taxation of services. And we're seeing this development of taxation of services be very interesting to watch what happens in Maryland with the advertising tax, digital advertising, lots of issues with that. Do you remember uh, Florida had a tax on all services back in 1987? It scares me a little bit. And for those who don't, it, but lots of constitutional issues about where you can cite us it and all the things we're gonna talk about today existed in 1987. So the governor realized that this was a messed up tax and repealed it, but it was on the books for six months. And I remember when, when Florida would come out and audit, they would do a six month audit of services and you get a bill for like 
thirty-seven dollars. <laughs> and, and you remember what, what, what they were talking about? Audits at thirty-seven bucks. What do you do? You pay it, <laughs> right? Because it's just not worth it. You want to fight it. I'm like, please let me take these cases up. They're great. And they're like, no, it's thirty-seven dollars. <laughs> you just charge me thirty-seven dollars, claiming you want to fight the thing. Doesn't make any sense. But what we're what we're gonna have to do now is separate out, and maybe at the end, maybe bring back together the citusing for sales tax purposes and the wackadoodle way that it's wackadoodle is a Latin word for wackadoodus. Okay, so it's totally a legal word. The wackadoodle way the states are approaching citusing for services. And then this, I don't know, I, I think the proliferation of marijuana, legality of marijuana has affected the states. So they came up with a concept, which is not a bad concept. How do we figure out, let's get away from positive performance. We'll talk about that. And then they, they like had this mind gathering. I don't know, they're out in a field doing a kumbaya thing. And they all came up with this. And it's like the telephone game. Because everybody walked away from that meeting with the word benefit in their head, right? They just can't figure out what that meant or was it where it was received, where it was sent, where it started, where it ended, who got it. And they all had different concepts. They thought they had this uniformity and they don't. So we'll get to that in a little bit. How's that for the intro? Does that work? That was perfect. Okay, good. And it was, and I gave Jordan five minutes, and I yeah. think he took five minutes. Five so minutes, I know. Awesome. Let's hear it for me. Five minutes. We're on, uh, we're on track. We're on track to finish within an hour. So, okay, as Jordan said, what we're going to do is split this up between sales tax first and then income tax. And the focus is going to be, again, on sourcing, on where the sale occurs, either for sales tax initially, and then we'll talk talk income tax. So on the sales tax side, we want to focus on services because as Jordan was saying, when you're, when you're shipping, whatever that is, if it's a makeup case or a court case or whatever we're going to call it, destination controls. And we pretty much know where the property ends up. You're going to have some challenges, drop shipments. You could have temporary storage. You could have something like software that actually has multiple use, concurrent use at the same time. Um, but for the most part, the tangible personal property rules are relatively straightforward. It's services that cause problems. And even though there are some states like Florida um, that have not been successful in adopting sales tax on services, there are actually some that tax basically all services. So South Dakota, Hawaii, New Mexico, um, they tax pretty much every service. In fact, we had um, I think Fred might remember this. We had an experience many years ago where we actually almost had to register with the South Dakota Department of Revenue uh, because we provide legal services and South Dakota taxes legal services. And we were representing a client in South Dakota and we needed permission to represent them. And one of the conditions was that we registered to collect sales tax because South Dakota charges or imposes sales tax on, on legal services and other professional services. But you've got some states that will tax just about every service. Then you have the other end of the spectrum where you've got some states that tax virtually no services like Illinois, California. We have something called the service occupation tax here, but that's really a tax on the property, not a tax on the service. And then you've got states in between, states that will tax a selected number of services or an identified list of services, uh, but it's not broad-based, it's not every service. So what are some services that states commonly tax? Um, we've got some examples here on the screen. So you've got things like repair, installation, maintenance, delivery, transportation, um, design, engineering services. Those are some of the common that you'll see from, from state to state. There are some sort of cutting edge services, if you will, um, that some states like to tax. So professional services, again, that's typically gonna be in the states like South Dakota, New Mexico that tax most services. Um, we are seeing some states starting to dip their toes into advertising. Jordan mentioned Maryland as an example with their tax on digital advertising services. Uh, but these are, these are uh, services that states typically don't tax that much. Um, insurance, you rarely see tax, sales tax on insurance services. You might have a premiums tax, which is a little bit different than a sales tax but you're typically not gonna see sales tax on insurance. And then finally, financial services. So your investment services, your brokerage services are typically not gonna be subject to a, uh, to a sales tax. Um, some of the trends that we're seeing. Um, so again, these are, these are examples of some services. These are, I guess, really the cutting edge services that I was mentioning before. 
Um, so what are some newer types of services that states are taxing? Um, information services, you know, we see that in some states, New York especially, and trying to distinguish between what is an information service and, and what is not. And that's one of the challenges with some of these newer services. So whether it's information services, whether it's software related services like SaaS or cloud computing, one of the challenges, and Sam and Chris were afternoon, is, is how do you know whether it's really a service or it's something else? In other words, are, is your client buying or are they selling software or are they providing a service? You know, sometimes that line is, is murky. And if it's software, then it could be considered something taxable. If it's more in the nature of a service, then it might fall outside the scope of what is, is subject to tax. We see this a lot, for example, with the city of Chicago and their, and their trans, uh, transaction tax, um, which is on the lease, among other things, the lease of non-possessory computer leases. And is it really a computer lease or is it a service? Because if it's more of a service, then it's not going to be subject to the transaction tax. Whereas if it's truly software, then it will be. So sometimes you have these definitional issues which, which go beyond the scope of what we're talking about today, but that is a big issue sometimes with services is exactly what it is that you're, uh, that you're getting. Okay, so the real focus, what we really wanna drill down on here is, is citusing, sourcing. So if a, if a state taxes a particular service, how do we know whether that service actually occurs in that state or whether the sale occurs in that state? And so there's a couple of different things that we want to take you into account as we, as we walk through this. Um, first, backing away from services for just a second, when you think about sourcing for sales tax, you, you have to think about what I like to call buckets. So a lot of the folks at H&B hear me talk about buckets all the time. And I think if you're faced with a particular transaction, you have to think about what bucket it falls into. So for sourcing of sales tax, the three buckets that we have our tangible personal property, you know, which we've always already said is relatively straightforward. It's a destination rule. Again, you've got some temporary storage rules. You might have concurrent use rules, but for the most part, it's pretty straightforward based on destination. The second bucket that we have, which we're gonna spend most of our time on are services. So how do you source or how do you citus a service? What we're gonna see is generally speaking, it's also based on destination. Okay, now identifying the destination of a service is more challenging than identifying the destination for tangible personal property. But services are still generally speaking destination based. And then finally, the third bucket is digital goods. So intangibles, digital goods, you know, the kind of stuff that we used to see in tangible form, whether it's, it's books or music or uh, movies, you know, things that we used to buy in tangible form we now buy digitally, we buy through downloads. They're gonna have their own separate rules, citusing rules, sourcing rules for digital goods. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on that this afternoon, but they also generally follow a destination rule. But again, the same challenge, right? It's not the same thing as delivering a tangible item. It's if you're downloading it, if you're getting it on your phone, you're getting it on your tablet, where exactly does that delivery occur? And how is the vendor supposed to know that? So there's a whole host of issues with digital goods um, that we are not just going to do. give you an example, just something to think about. And this is what where you kind of get a little bit crazy here. Let's just say something simple. Anybody book readers? Anybody a book reader? Anybody hardcover books, softcover books? Actually, read books like paper, like for that thing. Thank you. That's great. So when you go in to buy it, that, no reading is good. I have, I've heard of reading is good. You buy, you get a book, you go buy a book, you go to a bookstore, you get a book, or you go what Amazon used to sell, which for books, you buy a book and it gets sent to you, right? Where's the tax due? You got the book, tangible personal property. But let's say you're like me and you get a little bit lazier and you don't want to read a book. You want someone to read the book to you. So you call up a service, you say, hey, I, can you read Gone in the Wind to me on the phone? I don't know why you would do that, but let's, <laughs> let's, just, let's just say that you did. So you got Gone in the Wind, on the phone and they're reading it to you. So that's a service. At the end of the day, you got the contents of going in the wind. But then let's say, you know what? That's, I, I have no patience to listen to anybody else other than my own voice. So let's not go there. And let's just say, I want a digital good. What if I download it onto my Kindle and I read it myself at my leisure, but it's lighter and I can do other stuff on my Kindle as well. 
at the end of the day, you got the same thing. You got a book, you got someone reading the book, or you got the book in a digital form. You would think that would be all treated equivalently. Nothing could be more wrong than that. That's the crazy thing. So when you think about the reason why it got taxed and what you got out of it, that's the same. But the taxation of it is going to be different based upon the form that you get. And that's just so bizarre to me. Yeah, un unless the state has caught up with technology, right? I think that's the challenge a lot of times is that these, these rules, the statutory rules were enacted years ago before we had gone with the wind in digital form. We only had it in tangible form. So states only tax the tangible version of gone with the wind. Now, some states are figuring out that people no longer buy the tangible version of Gone with the Wind. They want the digital version. Their tax code is behind. It's outdated. It's got to get caught up. And so some states have done a better job of that, of adding digital goods or digital services to their tax code. Um, but even if they have, we still have that sourcing issue, which is a lot more challenging if you're buying a digital version of Gone with the Wind because you might, you might be living in Chicago but you might be on vacation in Florida and you download Gone with the Wind in Florida. Is that a Florida sale? Is that a Chicago sale? And if it's a Florida sale, how does the vendor know, whoever it is that is selling you Gone with the Wind on your phone, how do they know you're in Florida at that point, right? So those are the sorts of sourcing issues that we have with digital goods, which is going to be a great topic for another time, um, but it's not what we're talking about right now. We're getting into- uh, During ping service. pong, that's what we're gonna be talking that's about. That's right. We'll completely <laughs> distract you. That's right. So services, okay. The challenge, the challenge with services is when you have a service provider and a client or a customer in different states, right? If they're both in the same state, then there's really no sourcing issue. So, you know, the example we like to use is if you go to get your haircut, and let's say it's a state that taxes haircuts. If you get a haircut in a particular state that taxes haircuts, there's no question where that sale occurs, where the service occurs. It's where you got your haircut because the service performer is in the same state as the client. Where you run into challenges is where you've got multi-state transactions. So your service provider and your client are in different states. So an example might be say a landscape architect. There are some states that impose sales tax on landscape services. If that landscape architect is in Illinois, their client is in Indiana, the landscape architect does all of the planning and the drafting and the writing and what they do if they do that all in Chicago, but then they have to deliver the plans and implement the plans in Indiana, where does that sale take place, right? Is it, is it Illinois, is it Indiana, is it a combination? That's the challenge with sales tax on services when you have the service provider and the client in two different states. Now again, suggested earlier that the general approach here is still a destination approach. It's an approach that is based on where the recipient is, where the client is, where they get the benefit of their service, sort of like on the income tax side. That's generally what you're gonna find for, um, for services. What we wanna do by way of example is, is walk you through what the streamlined sales tax project has said about this. So, so the SSTP is a, it's a project, it's an agreement among the states um, that try to provide some, some rules, some clarity, so that states could have some degree of uniformity, so that we don't have 45 different sets of rules, that we have some kind of common base, commonality among the states. And so the SSTP group looked at this, and as part of their model rules, they came up sourcing rules for sales tax on services and where you should source the sale and CITUS the sale. So these are the first three rules for CITUSing services under the streamlined sales tax project or agreement. Now, the SSTP rules talk about, you can see it on the screen, they talk about products, all right? So, so it sounds like they're talking about tangible goods, but these rules actually do apply to services as well. So the first thing SSTP says is you look to the location, um, the business location of the seller. So what, what this is contemplating actually is an over-the-counter sale. So again, it's a little 
awkward. It's a little counterintuitive to be thinking about an over-the-counter sale with a service. This is really more applicable for a product where you walk into a store, you buy something at the counter. But the concept here, again, is sort of, it's sort of like the hairdresser example that I used before, right? The haircut example, where everything is occurring in the same state. So, so this first rule, this first example, really isn't as relevant for services. If that doesn't apply for whatever reason, then we go to the second rule, which says that you source the sale um, to the location, the business location of the seller um, when the product is received, when the product is not received by the purchaser at the business location, then it's sourced to where receipt occurs, the buyer where the customer actually receives the service. Okay, so this is the destination rule that we were talking about. Um, and that's going to be your general rule, your common rule with services. The problem sometimes, though, is you might not know for whatever reason, the vendor, the seller, they might not know exactly where that receipt occurs. With my landscaping example, sure, you know where your property is, you know where you're performing your landscaping services. But there might be situations where you don't know, where it's harder to determine, or maybe there's multiple use, concurrent use. So for whatever reason, rule number two really isn't practical. You don't know exactly where the receipt occurs. So then we jump to number three. And what number three says is you look to the address that the seller maintains in their books and records for the customer. So this is an address-based rule. So you're looking at address. Um, and it's the address that you normally maintain in your books and records. Again, that's going to be problematic in itself as well because... Um, is that really where the sale occurs? Well, it might not be, but it's kind of a default rule. It's okay, we don't really know anything else, so we're, we're just going to use the address. Whatever address we have in our records for this customer, that's going to be the default rule if we really don't know where receipt occurs. Now, the problem sometimes you might not have a, an address in your records. You might not have something. You might not have known this customer before. You might not have an address in your books and records. So what the SSTP rules say, is well, then it becomes as part of the transaction, did you collect an address from the customer, right? Did you have to ask for an address for billing purposes? Again, a bit of a challenge because in today's day and age, a lot of bills are not sent to a physical address. The address you collect might not be a mailing address, it could be an email address. So even though these rules sometimes default to an address, Again, there are some vendors who don't actually collect an address as part of a transaction or as part of a contract because they don't need it. So the ultimate rule here is if you have none of the above, right? You don't really know where the, the service is delivered to. You don't really have a good address, um, whether it's a billing address or something else. You really know nothing else about that customer. Then it ultimately defaults to where you perform the service. So, so the takeaway from this is most of, again, most of these rules under SSTP are based on destination. It's based on where the service is delivered to, where the service is received, where the benefit of that service is received, not where the service is performed. Okay, I think that's the key. Until you get to that final rule, right? Um, if, you, if you're in a situation, if the vendor's in a situation where they have no idea where their customer is receiving the service, they have no record showing a billing address, then you can look to where the service is being performed. But otherwise, this is a destination, a receipt-based approach, okay? This is SSTP. Um, this is just a kind of a summary, quick summary of the SSTP rules. One of the other issues um, that we see a lot is what happens if, the receipt occurs in multiple states, okay? And simultaneously, you know, sort of concurrent use in multiple states. And, and that's a challenge. And historically, states would not allow for apportionment of sales tax, especially with tangible personal property. So, you know, think of big items like boats and airplanes. You know, there have been attempts by taxpayers to try to apportion sales tax on items that move around. With tangible personal property, it's very difficult to apportion sales tax. You typically pay tax in one state and then get credits in the other states. We are seeing a trend though, where states are now either allowing or actually requiring apportionment of the tax base um, in situations involving services where those services occur in multiple states. 
okay? And it might not be a true service. It might be something like software that is being used in multiple locations. So you have a single license or a single software agreement with multiple licenses where there are multiple licensees in different states that are using the software. And so we have, um, we have something, a lot of states have something called um, a uh, multi-purpose use certificate or a multi-point use certificate, an MPU, um, where if you're using an item in different states, you can provide a certificate to the vendor that tells the vendor, don't collect tax from me, I'll handle it, I'll pay the tax based on where my people are using the particular product. Um, the city of Chicago allows apportionment for its Chicago transaction tax. If the customer provides a vendor telling the customer or telling the, the vendor that the um, software is being used in multiple locations, you can apportion the Chicago transaction tax. So we are seeing a lot more of this um, than we did historically. Um, local issues. So there are some sourcing issues with local taxes. Um, so the best example would be Illinois. So we, we tend to see this a lot more at the local level um, rather than at the state level. And what we see a lot of times at the local level with sourcing is origin-based sourcing. So again, go back to what we said earlier about sourcing sales using a destination rule. That tends to be the rule at the state level. So you're going to source sales, whether it's TPP or services, you're going to source sales based on the ultimate destination. Sometimes with local taxes, what you see instead is origin-based. So what we mean by origin-based is where is the seller? Where is the vendor? Where is the service being performed? Or from where is the, 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 the TPP being sold? Um, so that's a local sourcing issue um, that again, you don't tend to see a lot at the state level, but at the local level, you are going to see origin sourcing. Okay, um, one recent case that we want to talk about. Um, and uh, one case, we're one for one. This is a taxpayer victory. This is the, uh, the Oracle case out of Massachusetts. It was actually Oracle and Microsoft together um, in the same case. So these are, they're software vendors. Um, and they had a customer in Massachusetts that they sold software to. And they charged sales on the entire place. So they charged and collect tax on 100% of the invoice. The customer went back to them after the fact and said, you know, we actually use this software all over the place. We're based in Massachusetts, but we have users all over the country. So it doesn't seem right that we should have to pay Massachusetts sales tax on 100% of the invoice. So they went to Oracle and, and Microsoft and they said, can you guys get our money back for us? And so Oracle and Microsoft pursued refund claims um, the short version is they got their money back. Now, there were some procedural issues at the Massachusetts Supreme Court because the department was saying, no, you can't get your money back because it's a refund claim. But the point here is Massachusetts really didn't dispute that the tax could be apportioned. You know, they didn't dispute that there was tax owed on less than 100% of the invoice. They agreed that as long as there was sufficient proof, sufficient evidence, that the customer really was using the software outside Massachusetts, there was no question that there was tax on less than 100% of the invoice. Again, it was more about a procedural issue as to whether they could use this refund procedure to get their money back. But again, this is a good example of a situation where states are starting to recognize that whether it's software or services or something other than a tangible good, you know, states are recognized can have concurrent use in more than one state, and so tax on less than 100% of the invoice in a particular state um, is very, very defensible. So I think we're going to start seeing more cases like this involving an apportioned tax base than we have, uh, than we have historically. All right, I've got a case in Pennsylvania we're fighting right now. We're arguing headcount, which is what they use, employees, availability to use it, spread out across the country. And they're saying they want actual proof of usage. They want time that everybody used it which is no one tracks it, no one keeps track of it. They're putting a standard, you, and then our position is, if you make that the standard, then no one qualifies for the apportionment of this, and then it's unreasonable under due process. Yeah, exactly, and in situations like this, if you're the vendor, you're in a, a tougher position because you don't really know as the vendor where your customer is using, again, whether it's software or a service, you have to rely on the customer. They're the ones that have to provide to you 
the evidence, the data, the information to say, you know, only tax X percent or don't tax us at all. You know, that's the MPU certificate that I was mentioning earlier, which says to the vendor, we've got this. It's sort of like a direct pay permit. We've got this. We'll pay the tax. You don't have to charge us anything. We'll figure out where we're actually using the, the service or the software. All I right. prep for this one. Do you have the swag? <laughs> I, 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 we have trivia. We've got trivia. It's a good one, too. Okay. I prep for this question. 19, 1992 was a long time ago. It was also a big year for the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, they issued at least four very significant SALT decisions that year. And, and when we say very significant, I mean like Mount Rushmore type salt decisions. These are really, One really did not big involve cases. Mount Rushmore, though. That's not a That's right. <laughs> Not a hint. Well, no, it was close, though. Close, I think. Though. One of them, yes. Close. We heard, so there's four cases. Um, we heard one of the cases mentioned earlier. Somebody threw out one of the cases. Laura. Quill is one. Yes, yeah, sales tax nexus. Sales Texas. We have we have three more cases. That's the only one you could have. Oh, Come on, really? Wrigley. Wrigley. Yes. We're right down the block. Aren't they just around the block here, the Wrigley building? Yes. Come on. Two we more. Get, have to give hints. <laughs> I came up with six. Did you? Okay. Yeah, well, I, I'm not good at math, so okay. it may be only be four. I came up with six. <laughs> Okay. So one other okay. one, think cheese and ketchup, at least the cheese part. Sweet cheese? It was a foreign case involving foreign dividends in the state of Iowa. Wait, could it be? <laughs> and the company Kraft. makes cheese. Yeah. <laughs> Kraft. Kraft case? Nope. Yep. And uh, Allied Signal, have you guys heard of Allied Signal? The Allied Signal case, portable business income. So there are, there's apparently eight more. I don't know. Well, I've got, I've got two more. I think these qualify. Yep. So one was Norliger Verhans. Um, it was whether Prop 13 in California was constitutional, okay, for keeping property tax. Welcome stranger, property tax values go up when you buy, otherwise they are limited to 1% a year. And there was another one called, um, Chemical waste management versus hunt, which had to do not necessarily the tax, it's kind of a fun, but a fee. They were charging people who dumped waste in Alabama from out of state more than they dumped, they charged people from in state to dump the same mm -hmm. waste. And that was held to be unconstitutional by Commerce Clause. Yep. So interestingly, um, let's see, one, two, one, four of the six cases were reversed the state Supreme Court. Okay. At the yeah. US Supreme Court, which is kind of cool. They took cases because they had something to say. And also, there were four taxpayer wins out of the six cases. Mm -hmm. Not the same. You would think every reversal would be in favor of the taxpayer. It wasn't. Right. That way. Good. Good trivia. Cool. All right. <laughs> no, I only looked up. Like, I stopped at six. I thought that was like <laughs> extra credit. Does anybody, anybody for all the goods, can anybody name any case beyond the top six? <laughs> All the goods. Yes. What is the 18-year anniversary of Chicago? St. Patrick's Day? Oh, the dumping. Oh, the tour bus. Uh, <laughs> wow. I do remember that, too. So we, we have an RV, and I always think about that. I mean, do you know how hard? You can't do that. You have to open it up and then drive it because you can't do it from inside. you got to be outside to release. It's, yeah whole different thing we're not going to get into dumping waste of rvs it's not a pleasant topic um anyway so the next part income tax services is everything that david said forget about <laughs> it's very yes. important that we forget about everything you talked mm -hmm. about um and i, I it? yeah i might as well i'm not I, don't yell at me if i don't keep up with my slides it's kind of a distraction um really just listen comment throw things at him it'd be perfect it'd be fine so why are we talking about market-based sourcing? You did the 19, what, 67, 45, 57, hike, Close. something like that, whatever. 92. You did, it comes out, comes out with a plan. Ideal, tangible personal property, destination. How do you deal with services, things other than tangible personal property? 
Cost of performance. What could be easier than cost of performance? Where are you located? Right, this is the easiest thing. So when you get a call from home, so don't you get this all the time? Where are you? Well, I'm with my phone, I'm right here, I'm with my phone. Where are you? How easy could that be? Cost of performance is where you are located. If you can't figure that out, we got problems, right? But of course it's more complex than that. It's not only where you are, but it's income producing activity that's directly used to produce income, right? So there's a whole bunch of things involved in it. Um, cost of performance, direct costs only. So you can't have independent contractors. You can't have things that don't, don't um, add on to or create or produce the income. And costing studies, how much of, of, of something would cost? If a person is working, doing a couple of different jobs, we all do. how much of their salary actually goes to the production of income versus the management of income or some unrelated activity, okay? So really the accountants in the room were really excited about cost of performance because you would do cost studies. Anybody, CPAs in the room, accounting majors in the room, people take accounting classes. What was the worst class? Cost accounting, made no sense. And that's what we relied upon to figure out where our service income was from. No one liked it, no one could figure it out. Fred and I did like a million cases where we got these costing studies and transfer pricing studies and figured out, didn't matter. Marilyn Mar Mar left the room because she's on talk she left the room. <laughs> we did one for, for instance, a public case, AT&T. You figured AT&T would be able to figure out where income producing activity was. They, 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 didn't, they didn't know where they were making money, but they knew they were making money, which was good. They just didn't know where it came from, what products were doing it. We had to go to Oregon. We had to go to Massachusetts and argue where we made money. And what's weird is that Massachusetts agreed with us and said, yeah, you're good. It's the whole system, it's cost of performance, it's spread out over the country, everywhere you saw it online. Oregon says, no, no, we look at each, we look at every single call. You have to figure out on a call by call basis where your expense are, where you were, what you were doing. So they only had 100 billion calls to analyze in a year. There's no problem. And so we lost in Oregon, but we won in Massachusetts, exact same company on the same statute, cost of performance, same company, same statute, completely different responses from the states. Okay, got a little bit confusing. So you're like, oh, it's hard. And I'm gonna tell you, people tell you cost of performance was hard, and that's why we changed it. I'm throwing out the bullshit flag. <laughs> it had absolutely nothing to do with how hard it was. What it had to do was how much money can we make? Now let's talk about it for a second, right? Cost of performance, that's where you are. Okay, so I'm going to penalize you if you move into my state because now I'm going to say all your sales come from here and I get to tax the heck out of you. And I'm actually going to benefit those people who don't move into my state. You move into Indiana and you do the same kind of production, same business, cost of performance in Illinois. They're like, we don't pay anything in Illinois. Even though all of our customers are in Illinois, we pay them nothing. So for political reasons, forget the BS that's out there about, oh, it's too difficult, it's too hard, I can't do it, it's hard. Forget about that. Purely a political move to get companies to move into their states. And think about it, it's in conjunction with what's the other thing that's going on at this time as we make this transition. We're going to single sales factor. Why, why did we start off with three-factor apportionment? Does anybody know the reason of that? That could be a good trivia question. Mm -hmm. Why did we start with three-factor apportionment? Property, payroll, and sales. Where my people are, where my customers are, and where my plants are. Because they ask the economists. They go, how do I get income? And they go, I don't know, well, let's look, let's figure this out. Okay, we're gonna look at it. What do you, what do you have? Well, I've got people, they're great people. They gotta be in there. Well, I've got some manufacturing plants. I got buildings, I got equipment. Got to count property in there. Well, let's not forget our customers. They're pretty darn important. Okay. One third, one third, one third. Let's just make it simple, right? Because it made sense from an economic perspective that that's how you do it. And there was some truth to that. And then what's happened at the same time, we're going from cost of performance to market-based sourcing. What are we doing? We're eliminating property and payroll. Why are we eliminating? Do they become less important? Maybe in a service economy they do, but why do we really get rid of them? Because they discourage people from moving their businesses into your state. It's political reasons. Think about all the incentives, the credits that are going out there right now. The world is built up. How can I get you into my state? Oh, we're losing this headquarters over there. In Indiana, we got bad, now it's like bad politics in that state. I got to move my people out. I got to go someplace else. 
states are fighting with each other. And how do they do that without just making the crash system, tax system easy, crazy? They go away from property and payroll. They go away from cost of performance and they go to market-based sourcing. It's not a better way to do it. And that's the joke about it, right? Oh, this will be so much easier. Let's just go where your customer's located. And again, theory, I know where my customer's located. And the funny thing about this, and we'll get into this, how do you know where your customer's located? Well, I, I've got a billing address. <laughs> well, okay, who, and I, I'm guilty, I've changed during the pandemic. Who sends in checks every month to pay their utility bills, to pay their credit card bills? Any, I'm looking, I'm seeing no one, there are no stamp users in the book, in the room, okay? Why? Because we get sent a statement electronically and then we've got it hooked up to our checking account and on a certain day, it goes, right? What purpose does a billing address have to do with that? Does it matter where you are? Of course not. They just wanna know your bank account or your credit card that you're putting it on. It's completely irrelevant. Billing address is crazy. And yet we still rely upon billing address. <laughs> It's the stupidest thing. I mean, this, so it's, it's easy. I mean, I just think about all of the memos we used to send out by mail, right? And now we just, you go, gone, 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 <laughs> easy. All right, so I don't even know what slide we're on. Anyway, so how do we get here? Yeah. Cost of performance, market-based sourcing. That's the evolution. That's fine. We're going to focus on sales. We're going to focus on marketplace. Let's talk about that. Okay, so, okay, this is, we're not, this is really, we're gonna show you in a slide in just a second. We're not all market-based sourcing. You would think you have to, you have to compete. Just like you would think everybody should be 100% sales. We're not as a country. We're working our way there, everybody's working towards that. But for some political reasons, they're not doing it yet. I don't know why, put them at a disadvantage. Um, also, because of, we're talking about market-based sourcing, this has become a huge topic. Section 18 in the in, uh, UDITPA, right? Alternative enforcement. Never got used for the first hundred years. Well, probably not a hundred years. Let's I exaggerate a little bit. For the first 50 years, alternative parchment was the exception to the rule. And you had to have burdens come out. But now what do you read about? What cases are we reading right now? What's fair? Alternative apportionment. Your apportionment methodology doesn't apply to my business. The way that you're doing things doesn't apply to my business. But I've got section 18. I've got an alternative method of figuring it out. Because, and think about this. The evolution and the growing of different types of businesses is at an all-time high. People are creating businesses and things. That's the best. They're creating products that you know you didn't need until now. Great business model, right? They're creating. So the laws don't stay up with that stuff. They can barely stay up with the, the stuff that goes along slowly. Okay. So here's what we're going to talk about. This is, this is where they had the mind meld. They all walked away with benefit and service in their head. And then they got confused. Was the Tower of Babylon? Is that the story of Tower of Babylon? Everybody spoke the same name. Ba uh, Babel. Was it Babel? Babel, I think. Yeah. Ba Babylon. Tower Babylon. Yeah, Babylon. Where everybody was talking the same language, and then a bunch of people messed up, and they said, "Okay, now you can't talk to each other anymore." That's what happened. <laughs> Babel. <laughs> Babel, I think. Babel, <laughs> which is where Babel comes from. I think. Babel, like that. <laughs> isn't that the name of the program that you can listen to online and actually teaches you foreign languages? That's actually kind of funny. That's a little twist. I like that <laughs> irony there. All right. So where's the, where's the, they got two words. Where's the service received? I don't know. We'll figure that out. But as opposed to where the benefit of the service is received. Is there a difference between where the service is received and the benefit of the service is received? Is there a difference there? Okay. What about where the service is delivered? Well, how is that different delivered versus received? I sent it someplace, but you didn't get it because you moved, you brought your phone with you, got it someplace else. And where the customer is located, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> until you have to figure out who the customer is, right? Because that's one of the things we're going to get into. Customer, customers, customer. California just threw us a loop. You guys know about the ruling. We'll get to the ruling in California where they took away 15 years of doing it the same way and said, no, those were all wrong. We're changing our methodology. This actually is my favorite thing. Reasonable approximation. We're reasonable people. We should be able to figure this out. Let's look at our business and figure it out. The problem is, is that our normal reasonableness and the state's reasonableness don't always align, right? You would think something is easy and we'll get to this population, right? You hear about it in, in market-based sourcing. You can't figure out anything where anybody is, where the benefit is, where the service is. So we'll go with population. That's something we can agree on, right? So 
then we, I, I've been yelled at a couple of times and I still will make the argument. They go, okay, population. And they'll say, and Chris is looking at me because we argued this up in Minnesota. They go, yeah, we'll do it on population. I go, okay, that's cool. What's the population of Minnesota? I don't know, 3 million, 4 million, something like that. They go, okay, 3 million over 350. Million. No, no, whoa, time out. Why do you use population? Because it's just as likely that someone in your state would use this service as anybody else in the country would use your service. And I go, well, no, no, whoa, 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 whoa. Back off a second. Under that logic, it's just as likely that anybody in the world would use my service. Okay, that's another. What is the population of the world as of like uh, August 1st? 7.97 billion people. We're on the cusp of 8 billion. Okay, another trivia question. I looked up some weird stuff today. <laughs> when are we going to hit? When is the projection to hit 8 billion people on the world? And, then, and he talked about they said, the world, meaning Earth. It was really funny. <laughs> was like, we're not going to cost like seven cosmonauts. We're not going to include them in our 8 billion. We got to figure that in. Anybody guess? 10 years, take out 10 years, because people are dying faster, whatever, we're gonna be, we're 7.97. That means we're 300, we're 30, 30 million a page. And so 30 million people, one person a day, something like that in the world. November 15th, 2022. <laughs> Not that we're being precise or anything. They didn't give us the minutes or the day at the time. November, 20, November 15th, 2022, we're supposed to have 8 billion people. So when you go in, divide it by population, you got to lock in population, and they go, 350 million, you go, no, 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 7.97 billion, <laughs> okay? Because it's just as likely that somebody in India will use your service as somebody in Minnesota. Logically, it makes sense. They hate that answer. <laughs> they hate that answer. And if it's a web-based product, there's actually services out there for people who sell web-based services of what the, and I forget, it's like um, perme uh, to permeate, uh, internet permutation, permeation, I don't know how to say that. Uh, how many people in a country actually use the internet? Like in this country, we're like at 80 something percent, okay? And in some of the other countries, it's 17%. So you can even, I would agree to that. <laughs> divide 8 billion, multiply it by the people who actually run the internet. We had about 4 billion people. Let's divide it by 4 billion. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're thinking you're moving it over a complete decimal of where they want to be. They don't like the argument, but it makes logical sense. That's where we go. Okay, so just look at this. We talked about what's your goal to keep market-based sourcing under 100%, not to keep it under 100, or keep it, don't let it go over 100%. Okay, we tried to keep it under 100%, try to get low. Look at all the different methodologies we have out there. And one thing we learned in law school, probably the only thing I learned in law school, and it got beat is every word in a statute has meaning, right? That's what we're all trained to know. So you look at every single word, every comma, and versus or, big, right, huge difference. Every single word. So when it says benefit received versus service received, those are two different words. Benefit and service are different things. How do we Each of these states are going to argue that their statute is the best statute and the one that you have to think about all the time. There's no reason these have to be consistent. And they're not because they don't even use the same language. You know, in, before we talked about the at t cases, that, uh, that was using the, we get moody in here? Yeah. <laughs> it's time to finish. Okay, it's yeah. drinking time. I was going to okay. say. Yeah. 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 Oh. I'm sending a mess. Um, <laughs> I got thrown off by the AT&T. AT oh, AT when, when they had exact same uniform language in two states, the states came out with different answers. And now we've got four different statutes by you know as many as 10 states using one and other states the other 20 something states using something else how is that going to be consistent how are you going to do that and really the job your job right now whether you're a consultant or working in a business and you have a service component in there is to make something up that works for you reasonable approximation i'm a big believer in that and that might take alternative apportionment it may take something else and so books and records reasonable approximation the ordering office, customer's office, those are a throwback to Streamline, right? Why, why do they say these are important? Well, because Streamline said that. We're going to line up sales tax and income tax. Eh, wrong. Makes no sense to me at all. How do you know? That? Why is that even relevant? You know what you're doing there? You're just, excuse the expression, you're just making shit up then. 
Okay, I know the customer's office was down in Guam. They were ordering from Guam. So we're gonna source everything to Guam and we owe nothing to the states up here. And they're gonna go, well, how do you know that? Well, we, we, hey, do you know how to spell Guam? Yes, you do. Okay, we'll just check the box. Ordered it from Guam. Recent cases. And this is stuff that looks at it. And this, since this case, you guys familiar with that one out of Pennsylvania? This one we have to stand by. So it's, it's um, there's an expression, when the judge is ruling in your favor, you just shut up. Okay. When the state's attorney general and the Department of Revenue are fighting with each other because they disagree as to what the statute says, you as the taxpayer say, you know, call yeah. me when you guys are done. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what's going on there. They have a clear COP statute. It is the, you dip the definition almost virtually word for word as cost of performance. And yet the Department of Revenue said, oh no, it's market-based sourcing because we want, we'd rather have market-based sourcing. The legislature doesn't do anything. We're just going to tell everybody it's market-based sourcing. So since it said it filed originally in cost of performance because it read the statute, well done. Realized the Department of Revenue said market-based sourcing. They filed it. The Department of Revenue said, oh crap, we don't want to give money back. We'll just say you don't qualify. It goes to court over this refund claim and the Attorney General goes to the Department of Revenue and go, you've been doing it wrong the whole time. <laughs> And they actually sued each other as to whether the attorney general can disagree with the Department of Revenue, who's charged with interpreting the statutes dealing with revenue. I think this is the one where you say, you know, guys, carry on. Yeah. I'm good. <laughs> totally good. <laughs> uh, Sirius XM, again, and I, I wrote down, the, I found it so fascinating, the words that the statutes use to give us what they're talking about. So going back to census, it was income producing activity occurs, it, it was cost, uh, measured by cost of performance. That's what the statute says, really straightforward. In Texas, it says um, uh, if the services are rendered in Texas, if the services are rendered in Texas, then they get, it's a Texas service. Sirius XM had to do with Sirius XM radio. And the argument was, what, where's the service rendered? And what Sirius XM put on, on, on in evidence, I'm, I'm going to be buying drinks, aren't I? I'm going to be buying drinks. <laughs> but it, is they said, wait a second, 95% of our programming, all the costs associated with producing radio that you, shows that you guys listen to is done outside of Texas. Roadhouse Willie, for the country fans, Willie Nelson Station, that's made in Texas. That's the only one. And they go, well, if you look at the bulk of that, 95% of our expenses are outside, therefore you only get 5% of our income. And in Texas, no, no, we're a big ass state. We're a big state. Right, everything's bigger in Texas. We got a lot of people there. You can't do 5%, it's not right, it's not fair. We're gonna argue that the satellite antenna on your car is where the service is rendered. Because without that antenna, you couldn't get the signal. And they convinced them all the way up to the Court of Appeals that they were right. But the Supreme Court in Texas, given them credit, read the statute and said, no, no, the service is being, you know, the, the cost of the service is being done outside the state. You lose Texas. Good decision. A learned Supreme Court in Texas. Look through it. Um, Express scripts. And this is the part that we we're talking about before is, is it my customer? We thought customer location would be easy, right? But define customer. And you'll see these cases here talking about who is the customer? So in Express scripts, Express scripts, if you guys are not familiar with it, they negotiate the price of drugs from pharmaceutical companies to basically to you, right? Walgreens, they get in there and they negotiate what the, what the value of stuff are for all the people. And they negotiate between them. We don't buy from Express Scripts. We buy from Walgreens, we buy from CVS. We may get the benefit on behalf of the insurance company we use of what the prices are that Express Script did, but they're not working for us. And they argued, where's Express Scripts? Indiana said, well, no, no, we're gonna look at the amount of drugs sold in Indiana. Okay, and we're gonna, that's the benefit because we know that you've impacted everybody's life by making the cost of prescription drugs cheaper in Indiana. They go, no, no, no. We negotiated with the pharmaceutical companies in New Jersey in our home state of Minnesota. It has nothing to do with the, the ultimate customer's customer, the benefit that may have come down by having cheaper pharmaceutical products. It's not done there in the court agreed. Express scripts, the win for the taxpayers. Um, uh, which, which uh, let's see, no, I got four minutes. Um, Defender Securities, um, that's ADT rep, ADT rep, local rep. They're based in Indiana, sold home security uh, uh, systems and service to people in Ohio, okay? And then what it would do is get those contracts and we don't interest in servicing these contracts. We're really good at selling the contracts. They sold all of their contracts 
to ADT, who's located in the Midwest somewhere. It's not Kansas. Where are they located? I can't remember there. Certainly not Ohio. In, in Defender? No, in, in, um, in Defender. Yeah, I think they were in Denver. In Den Colorado. Yeah. Absolutely. ADT is based in Colorado. So they took all the service contracts, sold them in a side agreement to ADT based in Colorado. And, and what were those contracts for? Security in Ohio. So the ultimate service, the security service that you have in our houses, the alarms that all go off all the time, the cameras that see everything, it's being done in Ohio. But they tried to tax the gain and sale of the contracts in Ohio based on the number of security contracts they had in Ohio. And the court said, no. What was being sold? You're looking through the customer, the customer, the benefit of the service of the contracts that were sold, but the gain was from the sale of contracts that was between an Indiana company and a Colorado company had nothing to do with Ohio. Again, good analysis by the courts. Um, Lending Tree, and this is Washington. Washington's insane. Washington's crazy. They've been, they've, well, pot's been legal there for the beginning, right? They, they, they legalized it and they got weirdo on us. And, I'm, and not a component, not, not a pro con, whatever, don't care. I'm just saying it affects people's minds out in Washington. Lending Tree, what is Lending Tree? Anybody use, I use Lending Tree. I used it one time and I'll never do it again because it's really <laughs> complex and got better relationships with bankers now. But back then, Lending Tree, you go online, you say, hey, I want to finance, and they give you like a bunch of banks you can talk to, right? And then you pick some banks and you try to negotiate with them as to what you're going to pay, how much you're going to pay, how much you can put down, all the kind of stuff. And then Lending Tree gets paid by one, putting you all together, paid by the banks. And number two, if a bank is successful in getting a loan, the bank pays Lending Tree for thank you so much for the introduction. That's what happens. Washington said, well, we saw a bunch of people like Goodman were out there and they all got loans in Washington. So Lending Tree, part of your income has to be sourced to Washington because the ultimate beneficiary, the customer's customer, is located in Washington. They got loans in Washington. We're going to take some of your fees and put them there. They go, whoa, whoa, time out. Who's my customer? My customer is the bank. Follow the money. This is a Jerry Maguire moment. Follow the money. Who paid Lending Tree? Did I pay Lending Tree? Absolutely not. Did the bank pay Lending Tree? Absolutely. Where's the bank located? There's your customer. And they ratified, again, this battle of whose customer we're talking about. And that really brings us to California. Since 2009, California's looked at market-based sourcing and said, we will stop at your customer. Jerry Maguire, show me the money. Who paid you? That's your customer. In 2020, this, what, three months, four months, five months ago? Let's just, let's just sort of five months ago. Yeah. They said, you know what? All that stuff was gobbledygook. We didn't mean it. We were only kidding. Now customers, customers wide open for market-based sourcing in California, overturning 15 years of precedent. Don't worry about that. You're right about it. Not our problem. We got a new ruling. So California now is going to be looking for your customer's customer to determine. How do you figure out who your customer customer is? You ask your customer. And your customer won't be your customer very long if you ask them where their customers are. Right? It's like the dumbest system in the whole world. So then what happens? You go down to population. What have we learned today? If they go to population, what do we say? Global, I, and I'm waiting for expansion to Mars. We're gonna bring them in as well. We're not alone. How about just like the galaxy, the Milky Way? There's gotta be life out there. We're like 47 billion people. I'll give you a population of the galaxy. There's somebody you know in, in star 8752 that wants your service. Prove to me they don't. All right, NASCAR, and I just last, last one, Vectrum. I got 30 seconds, Vectrum, great case. Minnesota-based company. They traditionally do services in Michigan about 7% of the time, year after year after year, okay? One year, they get a major contract, biggest deal of the company's life, and they move everybody into Michigan for one year. 70% of their revenue is being generated in Michigan in 2011, and the owners say, this is great. Let's sell the business. Gain on the sale of the business. Where does it get sourced? You look at your apportionment factors. What's the apportionment factor for Michigan in 2011? 70%. And Michigan goes, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll take the money. Yeah. Bring it in, go, 70%. Vector said, that is unreasonable. Alternative apportionment doesn't make sense. If anything we owe you, let's look historically at 7%. And through the Supreme Court now, right? Mm -hmm. Vectrum is one. So when things are distortive in a particular year, they're not the norm. There's room to fight back Vectrum's your case. Okay, Chris is standing here staring me down. I know there's booze up there. What's that? <laughs> I broke my promise. 
Where yeah. are we? How much? That's so right. bad. That's right. That's Rounding error. Population. <laughs> Population. <laughs> Q, I'm done. I got nothing.